Part One of The Snow Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Snow Queen. Story the First which describes the looking-glass and the broken fragments. You must attend to the commencement of the story, for when we get to the end, we shall know more than we do now about a very wicked hobgoblin. He was one of the very worst, for he was a real demon. One day, when he was in a merry mood, he made a looking-glass which had the power of making everything good or beautiful that was reflected in it almost shrink to nothing, while everything that was worthless and bad looked increased in size and worse than ever. The most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach, and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that no one could recognize them, and even one freckle on their face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. The demon said this was very amusing. When a good or pious thought passed through the mind of any one, it was misrepresented in the glass. And then how the demon laughed at his cunning invention! All who went to the demon's school, for he kept his school, talked everywhere of the wonders they had seen, and declared that people could now, for the first time, see what the world and mankind were really like. They carried the glass about everywhere, till at last there was not a land nor a people who had not been looked at through this distorted mirror. They wanted even to fly with it up to heaven to see the angels, but the higher they flew the more slippery the glass became, and they could scarcely hold it, till at last it slipped from their hands, fell to the earth, and was broken into millions of pieces. But now the looking-glass caused more unhappiness than ever, for some of the fragments were not so large as a grain of sand, and they flew about the world into every country. When one of these tiny atoms flew into a person's eye, it stuck there unknown to him, and from that moment he saw everything through a distorted medium, or could see only the worst side of what he looked at, for even the smallest fragment retained the same power which had belonged to the whole mirror. Some few persons even got a fragment of the looking-glass in their hearts, and this was very terrible, for their hearts became cold like a lump of ice. A few of the pieces were so large that they could be used as window-panes. It would have been a sad thing to look at our friends through them. Other pieces were made into spectacles. This was dreadful for those who wore them, for they could see nothing either rightly or justly. At all this the wicked demon laughed till his sight shook. It tickled him so to see the mischief he had done. There were still a number of these little fragments of glass floating about in the air, and now you shall hear what happened with one of them. Second Story A Little Boy and a Little Girl In a large town, full of houses and people, there is not room for everybody to have even a little garden, therefore they are obliged to be satisfied with a few flowers and flower-pots. In one of these large towns lived two poor children who had a garden something larger and better than a few flower-pots. They were not brother and sister, but they loved each other almost as much as if they had been. Their parents lived opposite to each other in two garrets, where the roofs of neighboring houses projected towards each other, and the water-pipe ran between them. In each house was a little window, so that any one could step across the gutter from one window to the other. The parents of these children had each a large wooden box, in which they cultivated kitchen herbs for their own use, and a little rose-bush in each box, which grew splendidly. Now, after a while, the parents decided to place these two boxes across the water-pipe, so that they reached from one window to the other, and looked like two banks of flowers. Sweet peas drooped over the boxes, and the rose bushes shot forth long branches, which were trained round the windows and clustered together almost like a triumphal arch of leaves and flowers. The boxes were very high, and the children knew they must not climb upon them without permission, but they were often, however, allowed to step out together and sit upon their little stools under the rose bushes or play quietly. 
in winter all this pleasure came to an end for the windows were sometimes quite frozen over but then they would warm copper pennies on the stove and hold the warm pennies against the frozen pane there would be very soon a little round hole through which they could peep and the soft bright eyes of the little boy and girl would beam through the hole at each window as they looked at each other their names were Kay and gerda in summer they could be together with one jump from the window but in winter they had to go up and down the long staircase and out through the snow before they could meet see there are the white bees swarming said Kay's old grandmother one day when it was snowing have they a queen bee asked the little boy for he knew that the real bees had a queen to be sure they have said the grandmother she is flying there where the swarm is thickest she is the largest of them all and never remains on the earth but flies up to the dark clouds often at midnight she flies through the streets of the town and looks in at the windows then the eyes freezes on the panes into wonderful shapes that look like flowers and castles yes i have seen them said both the children and they knew it must be true can the snow queen come in here asked the little girl only let her come said the boy i'll set her on the stove and then she'll melt then the grandmother smoothed his hair and told him some more tales one evening when little kay was at home half undressed he climbed on a chair by the window and peeped out through the little hole a few flakes of snow were falling and one of them rather larger than the rest alighted on the edge of one of the flower boxes this snowflake grew larger and larger till at last it became the figure of a woman dressed in garments of white gauze which looked like millions of starry snowflakes linked together she was fair and beautiful but made of ice shining and glittering ice still she was alive and her eyes sparkled like bright stars but there was neither peace nor rest in their glance she nodded towards the window and waved her hand the little boy was frightened and sprang from the chair at the same moment it seemed as if a large bird flew by the window on the following day there was a clear frost and very soon came the spring the sun shone the young green leaves burst forth the swallows built their nests windows were opened and the children sat once more in the garden on the roof high above all the other rooms how beautiful the roses blossomed this summer the little girl had learned a hymn in which roses were spoken of and then she thought of their own roses and she sang the hymn to the little boy and he sang too roses bloom and cease to be but we shall the christ child see then the little ones held each other by the hand and kissed the roses and looked at the bright sunshine and spoke to it as if the christ child was there those were splendid summer days how beautiful and fresh it was out among the rose bushes which seemed as if they would never leave off blooming one day kay and gerda sat looking at a book full of pictures of animals and birds and then just as the clock in the church tower struck twelve kay said oh something has struck my heart and soon after there is something in my eye the little girl put her arm round his neck and looked into his eye but she could see nothing i think it is gone he said but it was not gone it was one of those bits of the looking-glass that magic mirror of which we have spoken the ugly glass which made everything great and good appear small and ugly while all that was wicked and bad became more visible and every little fault could be plainly seen poor little kay had also received a small grain in his heart which very quickly turned into a lump of ice he felt no more pain but the glass was there still why do you cry said he at last it makes you look ugly there is nothing the matter with me now oh see he cried suddenly that rose is worm-eaten and this one is quite crooked after all they are ugly roses just like the box in which they stand and then he kicked the boxes with his foot and pulled off the two roses kay what are you doing cried the little girl 
and then, when he saw how frightened she was, he tore off another rose and jumped through his own window away from little Gerda. When she afterwards brought out the picture book, he said, It was only fit for babies and long clothes. And when grandmother told any stories, he would interrupt her with, But! Or, when he could manage it, he would get behind her chair, put on a pair of spectacles and imitate her very cleverly to make people laugh. By and by he began to mimic the speech and gait of persons in the street. All that was peculiar or disagreeable in a person he would imitate directly, and the people said, That boy will be very clever. He has a remarkable genius. But it was the piece of glass in his eye and the coldness in his heart that made him act like this. He would even tease little Gerda, who loved him with all her heart. His games, too, were quite different. They were not so childish. One winter's day, when it snowed, he brought out a burning glass. Then he held out the tail of his blue coat and let the snowflakes fall upon it. Look in this glass, Gerda, said he, and she saw how every flake of snow was magnified and looked like a beautiful flower or a glittering star. Is it not clever? said Kay, and much more interesting than looking at real flowers. There is not a single fault in it, and the snowflakes are quite perfect till they begin to melt. Soon after, Kay made his appearance in large thick gloves and with a sledge at his back. He called upstairs to Gerda. I've got to leave to go into the great square, where the other boys play and ride. And away he went. In the great square, the boldest among the boys would often tie their sledges to the country people's carts and go with them a good way. This was capital. But while they were all amusing themselves and Kay with them, a great sledge came by. It was painted white, and in it sat someone wrapped in a rough white fur and wearing a white cap. The sledge drove twice round the square, and Kay fastened his own little sledge to it, so that when it went away, he followed with it. It went faster and faster right through the next street, and then the person who drove turned round and nodded pleasantly to Kay, just as if they were acquainted with each other. But whenever Kay wished to loosen his little sledge, the driver nodded again, so Kay sat still, and they drove out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall so heavily that the little boy could not see a hand's breadth before him, but still they drove on. Then he suddenly loosened the cord so that the large sled might go on without him, but it was of no use. His little carriage held fast, and away they went like the wind. Then he called out loudly, but nobody heard him, while the snow beat upon him, and the sledge flew onwards. Every now and then it gave a jump as if it were going over hedges and ditches. The boy was frightened and tried to say a prayer but he could remember nothing but the multiplication table. The snowflakes became larger and larger till they appeared like great white chickens. All at once they sprang on one side, the great sledge stopped, and the person who had driven it rose up. The fur and the cap, which were made entirely of snow, fell off, and he saw a lady, tall and white. It was the Snow Queen. We have driven well said she. But why do you tremble? Here, creep into my warm fur. Then she seated him beside her in the sledge, and as she wrapped the fur round him, he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked, as she kissed him on the forehead. The kiss was colder than ice. It went quite through to his heart, which was already almost a lump of ice. He felt as if he were going to die, but only for a moment. He soon seemed quite well again, and did not notice the cold around him. "'My sledge! Don't forget my sledge!' was his first thought, and then he looked and saw that it was bound fast to one of the white chickens, which flew behind him with the sledge at its back. The Snow Queen kissed little Kay again, and by this time he had forgotten little Gerda, his grandmother, and all at home. Now you must have no more kisses, she said, or I should kiss you to death. 
K looked at her and saw that she was so beautiful he could not imagine a more lovely and intelligent face. She did not now seem to be made of ice as when he had seen her through his window, and she had nodded to him. In his eyes she was perfect, and she did not feel at all afraid. He told her he could do mental arithmetic as far as fractions, and that he knew the number of square miles and the number of inhabitants in the country. And she always smiled so that he thought he did not know enough yet, and she looked round the vast expanse as she flew higher and higher with him upon a black cloud, while the storm blew and howled as if it were singing old songs. They flew over woods and lakes, over sea and land. Below them roared the wild wind, the wolves howled and the snow crackled. Over them flew the black screaming crows, and above all shone the moon, clear and bright. And so Kay passed through the long winter's night, and by day he slept at the feet of the Snow Queen. End of Part 1 of the Snow Queen Part 2 of the Snow Queen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. The Snow Queen, Part 2. Third Story. The Flower Garden of the Woman Who Could Conjure. But how fared little Gerda during Kay's absence? What had become of him? No one knew. Nor could anyone give the slightest information, excepting the boys who said that he had tied his sledge to another very large one, which had driven through the street and out at the town gate. Nobody knew where it went. Many tears were shed for him, and little Gerda wept bitterly for a long time. She said she knew he must be dead, that he was drowned in the river which flowed close by the school. Oh, indeed, those long winter days were very dreary, but at last spring came, with warm sunshine. Kay is dead and gone, said little Gerda. I don't believe it, said the sunshine. He is dead and gone, she said to the sparrows. We don't believe it, they replied, and at last little Gerda began to doubt it herself. I will put on my red shoes, she said one morning, those the Kay has never seen, and then I will go down to the river and ask for him. It was quite early when she kissed her old grandmother, who was still asleep. Then she put on her red shoes, and went quite alone out of the town gates toward the river. Is it true that you have taken my little playmate away from me, she said to the river. I will give you my red shoes if you will give him back to me. And it seemed as if the waves nodded to her in a strange manner. Then she took off her red shoes, which she liked better than anything else, and threw them both into the river. But they fell near the bank, and the little waves carried them back to the land, just as if the river would not take from her what she loved best, because they could not give her back little Kay. But she thought the shoes had not been thrown out far enough. Then she crept into a boat that lay among the reeds, and threw the shoes again from the farther end of the boat into the water. But it was not fastened, and her movement sent it gliding away from the land. When she saw this, she hastened to reach the end of the boat, but before she could so, it was more than a yard from the bank, and drifting away faster than ever. Then little Gerda was very much frightened, and began to cry, but no one heard her except the sparrows, and they could not carry her to land. But they flew along by the shore, and sang, as if to comfort her, Here we are, here we are. The boat floated with the stream. Little Gerda sat quite still, with only her stockings on her feet. The red shoes floated after her, but she could not reach them because the boat kept so much in advance. The banks on each side of the river were very pretty. There were beautiful flowers, old trees, sloping fields, in which cows and sheep were grazing, but not a man to be seen. Perhaps the river will carry me to little Kay, thought Gerda, and then she became more cheerful and raised her head and looked at the beautiful green banks and so the boat sailed on for hours. At length she came to a large cherry orchard, in which stood a small red house, with strange red and blue windows. It also had a thatched roof, and outside were two wooden soldiers, that presented arms to her as she sailed past. Gerda called out to them, for she thought they were alive, but of course they did not answer, and as the boat drifted nearer to the shore, she saw what they really were. Then Gerda called still louder, and there came a very old woman out of the house, leaning on a crutch. She wore a large hat to shade her from the sun, and on it were painted all sorts of pretty flowers. You poor little child, said the old woman, how did you manage to come all this distance into a wide world on such a rapid rolling stream? 
and then the old woman walked in the water, seized the boat with her crutch, drew it to land, and lifted Gerda out, and Gerda was glad to feel herself on dry ground, although she was rather afraid of the strange old woman. Come and tell me who you are, said she, and how came you here? Then Gerda told her everything, while the old woman shook her head and said, Hem, hem. And when she had finished, Gerda asked if she had not seen little Kay, and the old woman told her he had not passed by that way, but he very likely would come. So she told Gerda not to be sorrowful, but to taste the cherries and look at the flowers. They were better than any picture book, for each of them could tell a story. Then she took Gerda by the hand and led her into the little house, and the old woman closed the door. The windows were very high, and as the panes were red, blue, and yellow, the daylight shone through them in all sorts of singular colors. On the table stood beautiful cherries, and Gerda had permission to eat as many as she would. While she was eating them, the old woman combed out her long flaxen ringlets with a golden comb, and the glossy curls hung down on each side of the little round pleasant face, which looked fresh and blooming as a rose. I have long wished for a dear little maiden like you, said the old woman, and now you must stay with me and see how happily we shall live together. And while she went on combing little Gerda's hair, she thought less and less about her adopted brother Kay, for the old woman could conjure, although she was not a wicked witch. She conjured only a little for her own amusement, and now, because she wanted to keep Gerda. Therefore she went into the garden and stretched out her crutch towards all the rose trees, beautiful though they were, and they immediately sunk into the dark earth, so that no one could tell where they had once stood. The old woman was afraid that if little Gerda saw roses, she would think of those at home, and then remember little Kay, and run away. Then she took Gerda into the flower garden. How fragrant and beautiful it was! Every flower that could be thought of for every season of the year was here in full bloom. No picture book could have more beautiful colors. Gerda jumped for joy, and played till the sun went down behind the tall cherry trees. Then she slept in an elegant bed with red silk pillows, embroidered with colored violets, and then she dreamed as pleasantly as a queen on her wedding day. The next day and many days after, Gerda played with the flowers in the warm sunshine. She knew every flower, and yet, although there were so many of them, it seemed as if one were missing, but which it was, she could not tell. One day, however, as she sat looking at the old woman's hat with the painted flowers on it, she saw that the prettiest of all of them was the rose. The old woman had forgotten to take it from her hat, and she made all the roses sink into the earth. But it is difficult to keep the thoughts together in everything. One little mistake upsets all our arrangements. What? Are there no roses here? cried Gerda, and she ran out into the garden and examined all the beds, and searched and searched. There was not one to be found. Then she sat down and wept, and her tears fell just on the place where one of the rose trees had sunk down. The warm tears moistened the earth, and the rose tree sprouted up at once, as blooming as when it had sunk, and Gerda embraced it and kissed the roses, and thought of the beautiful roses at home, and with them of little Kay. Oh, how I've been detained! said the little maiden. I wanted to seek for little Kay. Do you know where he is? she asked the roses. Do you think he is dead? And the roses answered, No, he is not dead. We have been in the ground where all the dead lie. But Kay is not there. Thank you, said little Gerda. And then she went to the other flowers, and looked into their little cups and asked, Do you know where little Kay is? But each flower, as it stood in the sunshine, dreamed only of its own little fairy tale of history. Not one knew anything of Kay. Gerda heard many stories from the flowers, as she asked them one after another about him. And what said the tiger lily? Hark, do you hear the drum? Turn, turn, there are only two notes, always, turn, turn, listen to the woman's song of mourning. Hear the cry of the priest. In her long red robe stands the Hindu widow by the funeral pile. The flames rise around her as she places herself on the dead body of her husband. But the Hindu woman is thinking of the living one in that circle, of him, her son, who lighted those flames. Those shining eyes trouble her heart more painfully than the flames, which will soon consume her body to ashes. Can the fire of the heart be extinguished by the flames of the funeral pile? I don't understand that at all, said little Gerda. That is my story, said the tiger lily. What says the convolvulus? Near yonder narrow road stands an old knight's castle. Thick ivy creeps over the old ruined walls, leaf over leaf, even to the balcony, in which stands a beautiful maiden. She bends over the balustrade and looks up the road. No rose on its stem is fresher than she, no apple blossom wafted by the wind floats more lightly than she moves. Her rich silk rustles as she bends over and exclaims, Will he not come? Is it Kay, you mean? 
asked Gerda. I am only speaking of a story of my dream, replied the flower. What said the little snowdrop? Between two trees a rope is hanging. There is a piece of board upon it. It is a swing. Two pretty little girls in dresses white as snow and with long green ribbons fluttering from their heads are sitting upon it swinging. The brother, who is taller than they are, stands in the swing. He has one arm around the rope to steady himself. In one hand he holds a little bowl, in the other a clay pipe. He is blowing bubbles. As the swing goes on, the bubbles fly upward, reflecting the most beautiful varying colors. The last still hangs from the bowl of the pipe and sways in the wind. On goes the swing, and then a little black dog comes running up. He is almost as light as the bubble, and he raises himself on his hind legs and wants to be taken into the swing. But it does not stop, and the dog falls, and he barks and gets angry. The children stoop towards him, and the bubble bursts. A swinging blank, a light sparkling foam picture. That is my story. It may all be very pretty what you are telling me, said little Gerda, but you speak so mournfully, and you do not mention little Kay at all. What do the hyacinths say? There were three beautiful sisters, fair and delicate. The dress of one was red, of the second blue, and of the third pure white. Hand in hand they danced in the bright moonlight, by the calm lake, but they were human beings, not fairy elves. The sweet fragrance attracted them, and they disappeared in the wood. Here the fragrance became stronger. Three coffins, in which lay the three beautiful maidens, glided from the thickest part of the forest across the lake. The fireflies flew lightly over them, like little floating torches. Do the dancing maidens sleep, or are they dead? The scent of the flower says that they are corpses. The evening bell tolls the knell. You make me quite sorrowful, said little Gerda. Your perfume is so strong. You make me think of dead maidens. Ah, is little Kay really dead then? The roses have been in the earth, and they say no. Cling clang, told the hyacinth bells. We are not tolling for little Kay. We do not know him. We sing our song, the only one we know. Then Gerda went to the buttercups that were glittering amongst the bright green leaves. You are little bright suns, said Gerda. Tell me if you know where I can find my playfellow. And the buttercups sparkled gaily and looked again at Gerda. What song could the buttercups sing? It was not about Kay. The bright warm sun shone on a little court on the first warm day of spring. His bright beams rested on the white walls of the neighboring house, and close by loomed the first yellow flower of the season, glittering like gold in the sun's warm ray. An old woman sat in her armchair at the house door, and her granddaughter, a poor and pretty servant maid, came to see her for a short visit. When she kissed her grandmother, there was gold everywhere. The gold of the heart is that holy kiss. It was a golden morning, there was gold in the beaming sunlight, gold in the leaves of the lowly flower, and on the lips of the maiden. There, that is my story, said the buttercup. My poor old grandmother, said Gerda, she is longing to see me, and grieving for me, as she did for little Kay, but I shall soon go home now, and take little Kay with me. It is no use asking the flowers, they know only their own songs, and can give no information and then she tucked up her little dress that she might run faster, but the Narcissus caught her by the leg as she was jumping over it. So she stopped and looked at the tall flower and said, Perhaps you may know something. And then she stooped down quite close to the flower and listened. And what did he say? I can see myself, I can see myself, said the Narcissus. Oh, how sweet is my perfume! Up in a little room with a bow window stands a little dancing girl, half undressed. She stands sometimes on one leg, sometimes on both, and looks as if she would tread the whole world under her feet. She is nothing but delusion. She is pouring water out of a teapot on a piece of stuff which she holds in her hand. It is her body's. Cleanliness is a good thing, she says. Her white dress hangs on a peg. It has also been washed in the teapot and dried on the roof. She puts it on and ties a saffron-colored handkerchief around her neck, which makes the dress look whiter. See how she stretches out her legs, as if she were showing off on a stem. I can see myself. I can see myself. What do I care for all that? said Gerda. You need not tell me such stuff. And then she ran to the other end of the garden. The door was fastened, but she pressed against the rusty latch, and it gave way. The door sprang open, and little Gerda ran out with bare feet into the wide world. She looked back three times, but no one seemed to be following her. At last she could run no longer, so she sat down to rest on a great stone, and when she looked round she saw that summer was over and autumn very far advanced. She had known nothing of this in the beautiful garden where the sun shone and the flowers grew all the year round. Oh, how I've wasted my time, said little Gerda. It is autumn. I must rest no longer. 
and she rose up to go on. But her feet were wounded and sore, and everything around her looked so cold and bleak. The long willow leaves were quite yellow. The dewdrops fell like water. Leaf after leaf dropped from the trees. The slow thorn alone still bore fruit, but the sloes were sour, and set the teeth on edge. Oh, how dark and weary the whole world appeared. End of part two of the Snow Queen. Recording by Ellie, December 2009. Part three of the Snow Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. The Snow Queen. Fourth Story. The Prince and Princess. Gerda was obliged to rest again, and just opposite the place where she sat, she saw a great crow come hopping across the snow toward her. He stood looking at her for some time, and then he wagged his head and said, Caw, caw, good day, good day. He pronounced the words as plainly as he could, because he meant to be kind to the little girl, and then he asked her where she was going all alone in the wide world. The word alone Gerda understood very well, and knew how much it expressed. So then she told the crow the whole story of her life and adventures, and asked him if he had seen little Kay. The crow nodded his head very gravely, and said, Perhaps I have. It may be. No, do you think you have? cried little Gerda, and she kissed the crow and hugged him almost to death with joy. Gently, gently, said the crow. I believe, I know. I think it may be little Kay, but he has certainly forgotten you by this time for the princess. Does he live with the princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, replied the crow. But it is so difficult to speak your language. If you understand the crow's language, then I can explain it better. Do you? No. I have never learnt it, said Gerda, but my grandmother understands it, and used to speak it to me. I wish I had learnt it. It does not matter, answered the crow. I will explain as well as I can, although it will be very badly done. And he told her what he had heard. In this kingdom where we now are, said he, there lives a princess who is so wonderfully clever that she has read all the newspapers in the world, and forgotten them too, although she is so clever. A short time ago, as she was sitting on her throne, which people say is not such an agreeable seat as is often supposed, she began to sing a song, which commences in these words. Why should I not be married? Why not indeed? said she, and so she determined to marry if she could find a husband who knew what to say when he was spoken to, and not one who could only look grand, for that was so tiresome. Then she assembled all her court ladies together at the beat of the drum, and when they heard of her intentions they were very much pleased. "'We are so glad to hear it,' said they. "'We were talking about it ourselves the other day. "'You may believe that every word I tell you is true.' said the crow, for I have a tame sweetheart who goes freely about the palace, and she told me all this. Of course his sweetheart was a crow, for birds of a feather flock together, and one crow always chooses another crow. Newspapers were published immediately with a border of hearts, and the initials of the princess among them. They gave notice that every young man who was handsome was free to visit the castle and speak with the princess and those who could reply loud enough to be heard when spoken to were to make themselves quite at home at the palace, but the one who spoke best would be chosen as a husband for the princess. Yes, yes, you may believe me, it is all as true as I sit here, said the crow. The people came in crowds. There was a great deal of crushing and running about, but no one succeeded either on the first or second day. They could all speak very well, while they were outside in the streets, but when they entered the palace gates, and saw the guards in silver uniforms, and the footmen in their golden livery on the staircase, and the great halls lighted up, they became quite confused, 
and when they stood before the throne on which the princess sat they could do nothing but repeat the last words she had said and she had no particular wish to hear her own words ever again it was just as if they had all taken something to make them sleepy while they were in the palace for they did not recover themselves nor speak till they got back again into the street there was quite a long line of them reaching from the town gate to the palace i went myself to see them said the crow they were hungry and thirsty for in the palace they did not even get a glass of water some of the wisest had taken a few slices of bread and butter with them but they did not share it with their neighbors they thought if they went in to the princess looking hungry there would be a better chance for themselves but kay tell me about little kay said gerda was he amongst the crowd stop a bit we are just coming to him it was on the third day there came marching cheerfully along to the palace a little personage without horses or carriage his eyes sparkling like yours he had beautiful long hair but his clothes were very poor that was kay said gerda joyfully oh then i have found him said she and she clapped her hands he had a little knapsack on his back added the crow no it must have been a sledge said gerda for he went away with it it may have been so said the crow i did not look at it very closely but i know from my tame sweetheart that he passed through the palace gates so the guards in their silver uniform and the servants in their liveries of gold on the stairs but he was not in the least embarrassed it must be very tiresome to stand on the stairs he said i prefer to go in the rooms were blazing with light counsellors and ambassadors walked about with bare feet carrying golden vessels it was enough to make any one feel serious his boots creaked loudly as he walked and yet he was not at all uneasy it must be kay said gerda i know he had new boots on i have heard them creak in grandmother's room they really did creak said the crow yet he went boldly up to the princess herself who was sitting on a pearl as large as a spinning wheel and all the ladies of the court were present with their maids and all the cavaliers with their servants and each of the maids had another maid to wait upon her and the cavalier's servants had their own servants as well as a page each they all stood in circles round the princess and the nearer they stood to the door the prouder they looked the servants pages who always wore slippers could hardly be looked at they held themselves up so proudly by the door it must be quite awful said little gerda but did kay win the princess if i had not been a crow said he i would have married her myself though i am engaged he spoke just as well as i do when i speak the crow's language so i heard from my tame sweetheart he was quite free and agreeable and said he had not come to woo the princess but to hear her wisdom and he was as pleased with her as she was with him oh certainly that was kay said gerda he was so clever he could work mental arithmetic and fractions oh will you take me to the palace it is very easy to ask that replied the crow but how are we to manage it however i will speak about it to my tame sweetheart and ask her advice for i must tell you it will be very difficult to gain permission for a little girl like you to enter the palace oh yes but i shall gain permission easily said gerda for when kay hears that i am here he will come out and fetch me in immediately wait for me here by the palings said the crow wagging his head as he flew away it was late in the evening before the crow returned caw caw he said she sends you greeting and here is a little roll which she took from the kitchen for you there is plenty of bread there and she thinks you must be hungry it is not possible for you to enter the palace by the front entrance the guards in silver uniform and the servants in gold livery would not allow it but do not cry we will manage to get you in my sweetheart knows a little back entrance that leads to the sleeping apartments and she knows where to find the key then they went into the garden through the great avenue where the leaves were falling one after another and they could see the light in the palace being put out in the same manner and the crow led little gerda to the back door which stood ajar 
Oh, how little Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing! It was just as if she were going to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know where little Kay was. It must be he, she thought, with those clear eyes and that long hair. She could fancy she saw him smiling at her, as he used to at home, when they sat among the roses. He would certainly be glad to see her, and to hear what a long distance she had come for his sake, and to know how sorry they had been at home because he did not come back. Oh, what joy and yet fear she felt! They were now on the stairs, and in a small closet at the top a lamp was burning. In the middle of the floor stood the tame crow, turning her head from side to side, and gazing at Gerda, who curtsied as her grandmother had taught her to do. "'My betrothed has spoken so very highly of you, my little lady,' said the tame crow. "'Your life history, Vita, as it may be called, is very touching.' If you will take the lamp, I will walk before you. We will go straight along this way. Then we shall meet no one. It seems to me as if somebody were behind us, said Gerda, as something rushed by her like a shadow on the wall, and then horses with flying manes and thin legs, hunters, ladies and gentlemen on horseback, glided by her like shadows on the wall. They are only dreams, said the crow. They are coming to fetch the thoughts of the great people out hunting. All the better, for we shall be able to look at them in their beds more safely. I hope that when you rise to honour and favour you will show a grateful heart. You may be quite sure of that, said the crow from the forest. They now came into the first hall, the walls of which were hung with rose-coloured satin, embroidered with artificial flowers. Here the dreams again flitted by them, but so quickly that Gerda could not distinguish the royal persons. Each hall appeared more splendid than the last. It was enough to bewilder any one. At length they reached a bedroom. The ceiling was like a great palm tree, with glass leaves of the most costly crystal, and over the centre of the floor two beds, each resembling a lily, hung from a stem of gold. One, in which the princess lay, was white, the other was red, and in this Gerda had to seek for little Kay. She pushed one of the red leaves aside, and saw a little brown neck. Oh, that must be Kay! She called his name out quite loud, and held the lamp over him. The dreams rushed back into the room on horseback. He woke, and turned his head round. It was not little Kay! The prince was only like him in the neck, still he was young and pretty. Then the princess peeped out of her white lily bed, and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda wept and told her story, and all that the crows had done to help her. "'You poor child,' said the prince and princess. Then they praised the crows, and said they were not angry for what they had done, but that it must not happen again, and this time they should be rewarded. "'Would you like to have your freedom?' asked the princess. Or would you prefer to be raised to the position of court crows, with all that is left in the kitchen for yourselves? Then both the crows bowed, and begged to have a fixed appointment, for they thought of their old age, and said it would be so comfortable to feel that they had provision for their old days, as they called it. And then the prince got out of his bed, and gave it up to Gerda. He could do no more, and she lay down. She folded her little hands, and thought, How good everyone is to me! men and animals too then she closed her eyes and fell into a sweet sleep all the dreams came flying back again to her and they looked like angels and one of them drew a little sledge on which sat kay and nodded to her but all this was only a dream and vanished as soon as she awoke the following day she was dressed from head to foot in silk and velvet and they invited her to stay at the palace for a few days and enjoy herself but she only begged for a pair of boots, and a little carriage, and a horse to draw it, so that she might go into the wide world to seek for Kay. And she obtained not only boots, but also a muff, and she was neatly dressed. And when she was ready to go, there, at the door, she found a coach made of pure gold, with the coat of arms of the prince and princess shining upon it like a star, and the coachmen, footmen, and outriders, all wearing golden crowns on their heads. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the coach, and wished her success. 
the forest crow who was now married accompanied her for the first three miles he sat by gerda's side as he could not bear riding backwards the tame crow stood in the doorway flapping her wings she could not go with them because she had been suffering from headache ever since the new appointment no doubt from eating too much the coach was well stored with sweet cakes and under the seat were fruit and gingerbread nuts farewell farewell cried the prince and princess and little gerda wept and the crow wept and then after a few miles the crow also said farewell and this was the saddest parting however he flew to a tree and stood flapping his black wings as long as he could see the coach which glittered in the bright sunshine End of part three of the Snow Queen. Part four of the Snow Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. The Snow Queen. Fifth story. Little Robber Girl. The coach drove on through a thick forest where it lighted up the way like a torch and dazzled the eyes of some robbers who could not let it pass them unmolested. It is gold, it is gold, cried they, rushing forward and seizing the horses. Then they struck their little jockeys, the coachman and the footman dead, and pulled little Gerda out of the carriage. She is fat and pretty, and has been fed with the kernels of nuts, said the old robber woman, who had a long beard and eyebrows that hung over her eyes. She's as good as a little lamp. How nice she will taste, and as she said this, she drew forth a shining knife that glittered horribly. Oh, screamed the old woman at the same moment, for her own daughter had held her back and bitten her in the ear. She was a wild and naughty girl, and her mother called her an ugly thing, and had no time to kill Gerda. She shall play with me, said the little robber girl. She shall give me her muff and her pretty dress, and sleep with me in my bed. And then she bit her mother again and made her spring in the air and jump about, and all the robbers laughed and said, See how she is dancing with her young cup. I will ride in the coach, said the little robber girl, and she would have her own way, for she was self-willed and obstinate. She and Gerda seated themselves in the coach and drove away over stumps and stones into the depths of the forest. The little robber girl was about the same size as Gerda, but stronger. She had broad shoulders and a darker skin. Her eyes were quite black and she had a mournful look. She clasped little Gerda around the waist and said, They shall not kill you as long as you don't make us vexed with you. I suppose you are a princess? No, said Gerda, and then she told all her history and how fond she was of little Kay. The robber girl looked earnestly at her, nodded her head slightly and said, They shan't kill you, even if I do get angry with you, for I will do it myself. Then she wiped Gerda's eyes and stuck her own hands in the beautiful muff which was so soft and warm. The coach stopped in the courtyard of a robber's castle, the walls of which were cracked from top to bottom. Ravens and crows flew in and out of the holes and crevices, while great bulldogs, either of which looked as if it could swallow a man, were jumping about, but they were not allowed to bark. In the large smoky hall a bright fire was burning on the stone floor. There was no chimney, so the smoke went up to the ceiling and found a way out for itself. Soup was boiling in a large cauldron, and hares and rabbits were roasting on the spit. You shall sleep with me and all my little animals tonight, said the robber girl, after they had had something to eat and drink. So she took Gerda to a corner of the hall, where some straw and carpets were laid down. Above them, on lace and perches, were more than a hundred pigeons, who all seemed to be asleep, although they moved slightly, when the two girls came near them. These all belong to me, said the robber girl, and she seized the nearest to her and held it by the feet, and shook it till it flapped its wings. Kiss it, cried she, flapping it in Gerda's face. There said the wood pigeons, continued she, pointing to a number of less in the cage which had been fixed into the walls near of one of the openings. Both rascals would fly away directly if they were not closely locked up, and here is my old sweetheart Ba, and she dragged out the reindeer by the horn. He wore a bright copper ring around his neck and was tied up. We are obliged to hold him tight too, or else he would run away from us also. I tickle his neck every evening with my sharp knife, which frightens him very much. And then the robber girl drew a long knife from a chink in the wall and let it slide gently over the reindeer's neck. The poor animal began to kick, and the little robber girl laughed and pulled Gerda down into bed with her. 
Will you have that knife with you while you are asleep? asked Gerda, looking at her in great fright. I always sleep with the knife by me, said the robber girl. No one knows what may happen. But now tell me again about little Kay and why you went out into the world. Then Gerda repeated her story over again, while the wood pigeons in the cage over her cooed, and there the pigeons slept. The little robber girl put one arm across Gerda's neck and held the knife in the other, and was soon fast asleep and snoring. But Gerda could not close her eyes at all. She knew not whether she was to live or die. The robbers sat around the fire, singing and drinking, and the old woman stumbled about. It was a terrible sight for a little girl to witness. Then the wood pigeons said, Coo, coo, we have seen little Kay, a white foal carried his sledge, and he sat in the carriage of the snow queen, which drove through the wood while we were lying in our nest. She blew upon us, and all the young ones died excepting two of us. Coo, coo. What are you saying up there? cried Gerda. Where was the Snow Queen going? Do you know anything about it? She was most likely travelling to Lapland, where there is always ice and snow, asked the reindeer, that is fastened up there with a rope. Yes, there is always snow and ice, said the reindeer, and it is a glorious place. You can leap and run about freely on the sparkling ice plains. The Snow Queen has a summer tent there, but her strong castle is at the North Pole on an island called Spitzbergen. Oh, Kay, little Kay! said the girl. Lie still, said the robber girl, or I shall ram my knife into your body. In the morning Gerda told her all that the wood pigeons had said, and the little robber girl looked quite serious and nodded her head and said, That is all talk, that is all talk. Do you know where Lapland is? she asked the reindeer. Who should know better than I do? said the animal while his eyes sparkled. I was born and brought up there and used to run about the snow-covered plains. Now listen, said the robber girl. All our men are gone away, only mother is here, and here she will stay, but at noon she always drinks out of a great bottle, and afterward sleeps for a little while, and then I'll do something for you. Then she jumped out of bed and clasped her mother around the neck and pulled her by the beard, crying, My own little nanny goat, good morning. Then her mother filliped her nose till it was quite red, yet she did it all for love. When the mother had drunk out of the bottle and was gone to sleep, the little robber maiden went to the reindeer and said, I should like very much to tickle your neck a few times more with my knife, for it makes you look so funny, but never mind. I will untie your cord and set you free, so that you may run away to Lapland. But you must make good use of your legs and carry this little maiden to the castle of the Snow Queen, where her playfellow is. You have heard what she told me, for she spoke out loud enough, and you were listening. Then the reindeer jumped for joy, and the little robber girl lifted Gerda on his back, and had the foresight to tie her on, and even give her her own little cushion to sit on. Here are your fur boots for you, she said, for it will be very cold, but I must keep them off, it is so pretty. However, you shall not be frozen for the want of it. Here are my mother's large warm mittens, they will reach up to your elbows, let me put them on. There, now your hands look just like my mother's. But Gerda wept for joy. I don't like to see you fret, said the little robber girl. You ought to look quite happy now. And here are two loaves and a ham, so that you need not starve. These were fastened on the reindeer, and then the little robber maiden opened the door, coaxed in all the great dogs, and then cut the string with which the reindeer was fastened, with her sharp knife, and said, Now run, but mind you take good care of the little girl. And then Gerda stretched out her hand with the great mitten on it towards the little robber girl, and said, Farewell. And the way flew the reindeer over stumps and stones, through the great forest, over marshes and plains, as quickly as he could. The wolves howled and the ravens screamed, while up in the sky quivered red lights like flames of fire. There are my old modern lights, said the reindeer. See how they flash, and he ran on day and night still faster and faster, but the loaves and the ham were all eaten by the time they reached Lapland. End of Part 4 of The Snow Queen Recording by Ellie, February 2010 Part 5 of The Snow Queen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. P. Paul The Snow Queen Sixth Story The Lapland Woman and the Finland Woman 
They stopped at a little hut. It was very mean-looking. The roof sloped nearly down to the ground, and the door was so low that the family had to creep in on their hands and knees when they went in and out. There was no one at home but an old Lapland woman who was cooking fish by the light of a train-oil lamp. The reindeer told her all about Gerda's story, after having first told his own, which seemed to him the most important, but Gerda was so pinched with the cold that she could not speak. "'Oh, you poor things!' said the Lapland woman. "'You have a long way to go yet. You must travel more than a hundred miles farther, to Finland. The Snow Queen lives there now, and she burns Bengal lights every evening.' I will write a few words on a dried stockfish, for I have no paper, and you can take it from me to the Finland woman who lives there. She can give you better information than I can. So when Gerda was warmed and had taken something to eat and drink, the woman wrote a few words on the dried fish and told Gerda to take great care of it. Then she tied her again on the reindeer, and he set off at full speed. Flash, flash went the beautiful blue northern lights in the air the whole night long, and at length they reached Finland, and knocked at the chimney of the Finland woman's hut, for it had no door above the ground. They crept in, but it was so terribly hot inside that that woman wore scarcely any clothes. She was small and very dirty-looking. She loosened little Gerda's dress, and took off the fur boots and the mittens, or Gerda would have been unable to bear the heat and then she placed a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, and read what was written on the dried fish. After she had read it three times, she knew it by heart, so she popped the fish into the soup saucepan, as she knew it was good to eat, and she never wasted anything. The reindeer told his own story first, and then little Gerda's, and the Finlander twinkled with her clever eyes, but she said nothing. "'You are so clever,' said the reindeer. I know you can tie all the winds of the world with a piece of twine. If a sailor unties one knot, he has a fair wind. When he unties a second, it blows hard. But if the third and fourth are loosened, then comes a storm, which will root up whole forests. Cannot you give this little maiden something which will make her as strong as twelve men to overcome the Snow Queen? The power of twelve men, said the Finland woman. That would be of very little use. But she went to a shelf and took down and unrolled a large skin, on which were inscribed wonderful characters, and she read till the perspiration ran down from her forehead. But the reindeer begged so hard for little Gerda, and Gerda looked at the Finland woman with such beseeching cheerful eyes that her own eyes began to twinkle again. So she drew the reindeer into a corner and whispered to him while she laid a fresh piece of ice on his head. Little Kay is really with the Snow Queen but he finds everything there so much to his taste and his liking that he believes it is the finest place in the world. But this is because he has a piece of broken glass in his heart and a little piece of glass in his eye. These must be taken out, or he will never be a human being again, and the Snow Queen will retain her power over him. But can you not give little Gerda something to help her to conquer this power? I can give her no greater power than she has already, said the woman. Don't you see how strong that is? How men and animals are obliged to serve her, and how well she has got through the world, barefooted as she is? She cannot receive any power from me, greater than she now has, which consists in her own purity and innocence of heart. If she cannot herself obtain access to the Snow Queen, and remove the glass fragments from little Kay, we can do nothing to help her. Two miles from here the Snow Queen's garden begins. You can carry the little girl so far, and set her down by the large bush which stands in the snow, covered with red berries. Do not stay gossiping, but come back here as quickly as you can. Then the Finland woman lifted little Gerda upon the reindeer, and he ran away with her as quickly as he could. "'Oh, I have forgotten my boots and my mittens!' cried little Gerda, as soon as she felt the cutting cold, but the reindeer dared not stop. So he ran on till he reached the bush with the red berries. Here he set Gerda down, and he kissed her, and the great bright tears trickled over the animal's cheeks. Then he left her and ran back as fast as he could. There stood poor Gerda, without shoes, without gloves, in the midst of cold, dreary, ice-bound Finland. She ran forwards as quickly as she could, when a whole regiment of snowflakes came round her. 
they did not however fall from the sky which was quite clear and glittering with the northern lights the snowflakes ran along the ground and the nearer they came to her the larger they appeared gerda remembered how large and beautiful they looked through the burning glass but these were really larger and much more terrible for they were alive and were the guards of the snow queen and had the strangest shapes some were like great porcupines others like twisted serpents with their heads stretching out and some few were like little fat bears with their hair bristled but all were dazzlingly white and all were living snowflakes then little gerda repeated the lord's prayer and the cold was so great that she could see her own breath come out of her mouth like steam as she uttered the words the steam appeared to increase as she continued her prayer till it took the shape of little angels who grew larger the moment they touched the earth they all wore helmets on their heads and carried spears and shields their number continued to increase more and more and by the time gerda had finished her prayers a whole legion stood round her they thrust their spears into the terrible snowflakes so that they shivered into a hundred pieces and little gerda could go forward with courage and safety the angel stroked her hands and feet so that she felt the cold less and she hastened on to the snow queen's castle but now we must see what kay is doing in truth he thought not of little gerda and never supposed she could be standing in the front of the palace end of part 5 of the snow queen Part six of the Snow Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. The Snow Queen. Seventh Story. Of the Palace of the Snow Queen and what happened there at last. The walls of the palace were formed of drifted snow, and the windows and doors of the cutting winds. There were more than a hundred rooms in it, all as if they had been formed with snow blown together. The largest of them extended for several miles. They were all lighted up by the vivid light of the aura, and they were so large and empty, so icy cold and glittering. There were no amusements here, not even a little bear's ball, when the storm might have been the music and the bears could have danced on their hind legs and shown their good manners. There were no pleasant games of snapdragon or touch, or even a gossip over the tea-table for the young lady foxes. Empty, vast, and cold were the halls of the Snow Queen. The flickering flame of the northern lights could be plainly seen, whether they rose high or low in the heavens, from every part of the castle. In the midst of this empty, endless hall of snow was a frozen lake, broken on its surface into a thousand forms. Each piece resembled another, from being in itself perfect as a work of art, and in the center of this lake sat the Snow Queen, when she was at home. She called the lake the Mirror of Reason, and said it was the best, and indeed the only one in the world. Little Kay was quite blue with cold, indeed almost black, but he did not feel it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away the icy shiverings, and his heart was already a lump of ice. He dragged some sharp flat pieces of ice to and fro, and placed them together in all kinds of possessions, as if he wished to make something out of them, just as we try to form various figures with little tablets of wood which we call a Chinese puzzle. Kay's fingers were very artistic. It was the icy game of reason at which he played, and in his eyes the figures were very remarkable and of the highest importance. This opinion was owing to the piece of glass still sticking in his eye. He composed many complete figures, forming different words, but there was one word he could never manage to form, although he wished it very much. It was the word Eternity. The Snow Queen had said to him, When you can find out this, you shall be your own master, and I will give you the whole world and a new pair of skates. But he could not accomplish it. Now I must hasten away to warmer countries, said the Snow Queen. I will go and look into the black craters of the tops of the burning mountains, Etna and Vesuvius, as they are called. I shall make them look white, which will be good for them, and for their lemons and grapes. In the way flew the Snow Queen, leaving little Kay quite alone in the great hall, which was many miles in length. So he sat and looked at his pieces of ice, and was thinking so deeply, and sat so still, that anyone might have supposed he was frozen. Just at this moment it happened that little Gerda came through the great door of the castle. Cutting winds were raging around her, but she offered up a prayer, 
and the wind sank down as if they were going to sleep, and she went on till she came to the large empty hall and caught sight of Kay. She knew him directly. She flew to him and threw her arms around his neck and held him fast while she exclaimed, Kay, dear little Kay, I've found you at last. But he sat quite still, stiff and cold. Then little Gerda wept hot tears, which fell on his breast and penetrated into his heart, and sawed the lump of ice and washed away the little pieces of glass which had stuck there. And he looked at her and she sang, Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ shall see. Then Kay burst into tears, and he wept so that the splinter of glass swam out of his eye. Then he recognized Gerda and said joyfully, Gerda, dear little Gerda, where have you been all this time, and where have I been? And he looked all around him and said, How cold it is, and how very large and empty it looks. And he clung to Gerda, and she laughed and wept for joy. It was so pleasing to see them that the pieces of ice even danced about, and when they were tired went to lie down, they formed themselves into the letters of the word which the Snow Queen had said he must find out before he could be his own master, and have the whole world and a pair of new skates. Then Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they became blooming and she kissed his eyes, and they shone like her own. She kissed his hands and feet, and then he became quite healthy and cheerful. The Snow Queen might come home now when she pleased, for there stood his certainty of freedom in the world she wanted, written in shining letters of ice. Then they took each other by the hand and went forth from the great palace of ice. They spoke of the grandmother and of the roses on the roof, and as they went on the winds were at rest, and the sun burst forth. When they arrived at the bush with the red berries, there stood the reindeer waiting for them, and he had brought another young reindeer with him, whose others were full, and the children drank her warm milk and kissed her on the mouth. Then they carried Kay and Gerda first to the Finland woman, where they warmed themselves thoroughly in her hot room, and she gave them directions about their home journey. Next they went to the Lapland woman, who had made some new clothes for them and put their sleighs in order. Both the reindeer ran by their side and followed them as far as the boundaries of the country, where the first green leaves were budding. Here they took leave of the two reindeer and the Lapland woman, and all said farewell. Then the birds began to twitter, and the forest too was full of young green leaves, and out of it came a beautiful horse, which Gerda remembered, for it was one which had drawn the golden coach. A young girl was riding upon it, with a shining red cap on her head, and pistols in her belt. It was the little robber maiden, who had got tired of staying at home. She was going first to the north, and if that didn't suit her, she meant to try some other part of the world. She knew Gerda directly, and Gerda remembered her. It was a joyful meeting. You're a fine fellow to go getting about in this way, she said to little Kay. I should like to know whether you deserve that anyone should go to the end of the world to find you. But Gerda patted her cheeks, and asked after the prince and princess. They are gone to foreign countries, said the robber girl. And the crow? asked Gerda. Oh, the crow is dead, she replied. His tame sweetheart is now a widow, and wears a bit of black worsted around her leg. She mourns very pitifully, but it is all stuff. But now tell me how you managed to get him back. Then Gerda and Kay told her all about it. Snip, snip, snare. It is all right at last, said the robber girl. Then she took both their hands and promised if she ever should pass through the town, she would call and pay them a visit. And then she rode away into the wide world. But Gerda and Kay went hand in hand towards home and as they advanced, spring appeared more lovely with its beautiful flowers. Very soon they recognized the large town where they lived, and the tall steeples of the churches in which the sweet bells were ringing a merry peal as they entered it, and found their way to their grandmother's door. They went upstairs into the little room where all looked just as it used to do. The old clock was going tick-tick, and the hands pointing to the time of the day. But as they passed through the door into the room, they perceived that they were both grown up and become a man and woman. The roses out on the roof were in full bloom and peeped in at the window, and there stood the little chairs on which they had sat when children, and Gerda and Kay seated themselves each on their own chair and held each other by the hand, while the cold, empty grandeur of the Snow Queen's palace vanished from their memories like a painful dream. The grandmother sat in God's bright sunshine and read aloud from the Bible, Except ye become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And Kay and Gerda looked into each other's eyes, and all at once understood the words of the old song. Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ shall see. And they both sat there, grown up, yet children at heart, and it was summer, warm, beautiful summer. 
End of Part Six of the Snow Queen. Recording by Ellie. February 2010. Part One of The Little Mermaid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Ball. The Little Mermaid. Part One. Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep. So deep, indeed, that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples, piled one upon another, would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed, the most singular flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the sea king. Its walls are built of coral, and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The sea king had been a widower for many years, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very wise woman, and exceedingly proud of her high birth. On that account she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others, also of high rank, were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her granddaughters. There were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose-leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea but like all the others she had no feet and her body ended in a fish's tail all day long they played in the great halls of the castle or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls the large amber windows were open and the fish swam in just as the swallows fly into our houses when we open the window except that the fishes swam up to the princesses ate out of their hands and allowed themselves to be stroked Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold, and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as a flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if it were surrounded by the air from above, through which the blue sky shone, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather the sun could be seen, looking like a purple flower, with the light streaming from the calyx. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden, where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower-bed in the form of a whale. Another thought it better to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid, but that of the youngest was round like the sun, and contained flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful, and while her sisters would be delighted with the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared for nothing but her pretty red flowers, like the sun, excepting a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy, carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose-coloured weeping willow. It grew splendidly, and very soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The statue had a violet tint, and waved to and fro like the branches. It seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play, and trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her it seemed most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land should have fragrance and not those below the sea.
that the trees of the forest should be green and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was quite a pleasure to hear them her grandmother called the little birds fishes or she would not have understood her for she had never seen birds when you have reached your fifteenth year said the grandmother you will have permission to rise up out of the sea to sit on the rocks in the moonlight while the great ships are sailing by and then you will see both forests and towns in the following year one of the sisters would be fifteen but as each was a year younger than the other the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean and see the earth as we do however each promised to tell the others what she saw on her first visit and what she thought the most beautiful for their grandmother could not tell them enough there were so many things on which they wanted information but none of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest she who had the longest time to wait and who was so quiet and thoughtful many nights she stood by the open window looking up through the dark blue water and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails she could see the moon and stars shining faintly but through the water they looked larger than they do to our eyes when something like a black cloud passed between her and them she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them holding out her white hands towards the keel of their ship as soon as the eldest was fifteen she was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean when she came back she had hundreds of things to talk about but the most beautiful, she said, was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the quiet sea near the coast and to gaze on a large town nearby where the lights were twinkling like hundreds of stars, to listen to the sounds of the music, the noise of carriages, and the voices of human beings, and then to hear the merry bells peal out from the church steeples. And because she could not go near to all those wonderful things, she longed for them more than ever. Oh, did not the youngest sister listen eagerly to all these descriptions? And afterwards, when she stood at the open window, looking up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city, with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. In another year, the second sister received permission to rise to the surface of the water and to swim about where she pleased. She rose just as the sun was setting, and this, she said, was the most beautiful sight of all. The whole sky looked like gold, while violet and rose-colored clouds, which she could not describe, floated over her. And, still more rapidly than the clouds, flew a large flock of wild swans towards the setting sun, looking like a long white veil across the sea. She also swam towards the sun but it sunk into the waves, and the rosy tints faded from the clouds and from the sea. The third sister's turn followed. She was the boldest of them all, and she swam up a broad river that emptied itself into the sea. On the banks she saw green hills covered with beautiful vines. Palaces and castles peeped out from amid the proud trees of the forest. She heard the birds singing, and the rays of the sun were so powerful that she was obliged often to dive down under the water to cool her burning face. In a narrow creek she found a whole troop of little human children, quite naked and sporting about in the water, and she wanted to play with them, but they fled in a great fright. And then a little black animal came to the water. It was a dog, but she did not know that, for she had never before seen one. This animal barked at her so terribly that she became frightened and rushed back to the open sea. But she said she should never forget the beautiful forest, the green hills, and the pretty little children who could swim in the water, although they had not fish's tails. The fourth sister was more timid. She remained in the midst of the sea, but she said it was quite as beautiful there as nearer the land. She could see for so many miles around her, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen the ships, but at such a great distance that they looked like seagulls. The dolphins sported in the waves, and the great whales spouted water from their nostrils till it seemed as if a hundred fountains were playing in every direction. The fifth sister's birthday occurred in the winter, so when her turn came, she saw what the others had not seen the first time they went up. 
The sea looked quite green, and large icebergs were floating about, each like a pearl, she said, but larger and loftier than the churches built by men. They were of the most singular shapes, and glittered like diamonds. She had seated herself upon one of the largest, and let the wind play with her long hair, and she remarked that all the ships sailed by rapidly, and steered as far away as they could from the iceberg, as if they were afraid of it. Towards evening, as the sun went down, dark clouds covered the sky, the thunder rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the red light glowed on the iceberg as they rocked and tossed on the heaving sea. On all the ships the sails were reefed with fear and trembling, while she sat calmly on the floating iceberg, watching the blue lightning as it darted its forked flashes into the sea. When first the sisters had permission to rise to the surface, they were each delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw. But now, as grown-up girls, they could go when they pleased, and they had become indifferent about it. They wished themselves back again in the water, and after a month had passed, they said it was much more beautiful down below, and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms round each other and rise to the surface in a row. They had more beautiful voices than any human being could have, and before the approach of a storm and when they expected a ship would be lost, they swam before the vessel and sang sweetly of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea and begging the sailors not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song. They took it for the howling of the storm, and these things were never to be beautiful for them, for if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. End of Part 1 of The Little Mermaid Part 2 of The Little Mermaid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. The Little Mermaid. Part 2. When the sisters rose arm in arm through the water in this way, the youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry. Only the mermaids have no tears, and therefore they suffer more. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, said she. I know that I shall love the world up there, and all the people who live in it. At last she reached her fifteenth year. Well, now you are grown up, said the old dowager, her grandmother, so you must let me adorn you like your other sisters. And she placed a wreath of white lilies in her hair, and every flower leaf was half a pearl. Then the old lady ordered eight great oysters to attach themselves to the tail of the princess to show her high rank. But they hurt me so, said the little mermaid. Pride must suffer pain, replied the old lady. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all this grandeur and laid aside the heavy wreath. The red flowers in her own garden would have suited her much better, but she could not help herself. So she said farewell and rose as lightly as a bubble to the surface of the water. The sun had just set as she raised her head above the waves, but the clouds were tinted with crimson and gold, and through the glimmering twilight beamed the evening star in all its beauty. The sea was calm and the air mild and fresh. A large ship, with three masts, lay becalmed on the water, with only one sail set, for not the breeze stiffed, and the sailors sat idle on deck or amongst the rigging. There was music and song on board, and as darkness came on a hundred colored lanterns were lighted, as if the flags of all nations waved in the air. The little mermaid swam close to the cabin windows, and now and then as the waves lifted her up, she could look in through the clear glass window panes and see a number of well-dressed people within. Among them was a young prince, the most beautiful of all, with large black eyes. He was sixteen years of age, and his birthday was being kept with much rejoicing. The sailors were dancing on deck, but when the prince came out of the cabin, more than a hundred rockets rose in the air, making it as bright as day. The little mermaid was so startled that she dived under water, and when she again stretched out her head, it appeared as if all the stars of heaven were falling around her. She had never seen such fireworks before. Great suns spurted fire about. Splendid fireflies flew into the blue air, and everything was reflected in the clear, calm sea beneath. The ship itself was so brightly illuminated that all the people, and even the smallest rope, could be distinctly and plainly seen. And how handsome the young prince looked, as he pressed the hands of all present and smiled at them, while the music resounded through the clear night air. 
It was very late, yet the little mermaid could not take her eyes from the ship or from the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns had been extinguished, no more rockets rose in the air, and the cannon had ceased firing. But the sea became restless, and a moaning, grumbling sound could be heard beneath the waves. Still the little mermaid remained by the cabin window, rocking up and down on the water, which enabled her to look in. After a while the sails were quickly unfurled, and the noble ship continued her passage. But soon the waves rose higher, heavy clouds darkened the sky, and lightning appeared in the distance. A dreadful storm was approaching. Once more the sails were reefed, and the great ship pursued her flying course over the raging sea. The waves rose mountains high, as if they would have overtopped the mast, but the ship dived like a swarm between them, and then, under the lashing of the sea, as it broke over the deck, the main mast snapped asunder like a reed. The ship lay over on her side, and the water rushed in. The little mermaid now perceived that the crew were in danger. Even she herself was obliged to be careful to avoid the beams and planks of the wreck, which lay scattered on the water. At one moment it was so pitch dark that she could not see a single object, but a flash of lightning revealed the whole scene. She could see everyone who had been on board excepting the prince. When the ship parted, she had seen him sink into the deep waves, and she was glad, for she thought he would now be with her, and then she remembered that human beings could not live in the water, so that when he got down to her father's palace he would be quite dead. But he must not die, so she swam about among the beams and planks which strewed the surface of the sea, forgetting that they could crush her to pieces. Then she dived deeply under the dark waters, rising and falling with the waves, till at length she managed to reach the young prince, who was fast losing the power of swimming in that stormy sea. His limbs were failing him, his beautiful eyes were closed, and he would have died had not the little mermaid come to his assistance. She held his head above the water, and let the waves drift them where they would. In the morning the storm had ceased, but of the ship not a single fragment could be seen. The sun rose up red and glowing from the water, and its beams brought back the hue of health to the prince's cheeks, but his eyes remained closed. The mermaid kissed his high, smooth forehead, and stroked back his wet hair. He seemed to her like the marble statue in her little garden, and she kissed him again, and wished that he might live. Presently they came in sight of land. She saw lofty blue mountains, on which the white snow rested as if a flock of swans were lying upon them. Near the coast were beautiful green forests, and close by stood a large building, whether a church or a convent, she could not tell. Orange and citron trees grew in the garden, and before the door stood lofty palms. The sea here formed a little bay, in which the water was quite still but very deep. So she swam with the handsome prince to the beach, which was covered with fine white sand, and there she laid him in the warm sunshine, taking care to raise his head higher than his body. Then bells sounded in the large white building, and a number of young girls came into the garden. The little mermaid swam out farther from the shore and placed herself between some high rocks that rose out of the water. Then she covered her head and neck with the foam of the sea, so that her little face might not be seen, and watched to see what would become of the poor prince. She did not wait long before she saw a young girl approach the spot where he lay. She seemed frightened at first, but only for a moment. Then she fetched a number of people, and the mermaid saw that the prince came to life again, and smiled upon those who stood around him. But to her he sent no smile. He knew not that she had saved him. This made her very unhappy, and when he was led away into the great building, she dived down sorrowfully into the water, and returned to her father's castle. She had always been silent and thoughtful, and now she was more so than ever. Her sisters asked her what she had seen during her first visit to the surface of the water, but she would tell them nothing. Many an evening and morning did she rise to the place where she had left the prince. She saw the fruits in the garden ripen till they were gathered. The snow on the tops of the mountains melted away, but she never saw the prince, and therefore she returned home, always more sorrowful than before. It was her only comfort to sit in her own little garden and fling her arm around the beautiful marble statue, which was like the prince. But she gave up tending her flowers, and they grew in wild confusion over the path, twining their long leaves and stems around the branches of the trees, so that the whole place became dark and gloomy. At length she could bear it no longer, and told one of her sisters all about it. Then the others heard the secret, and very soon it became known to two mermaids whose intimate friend happened to know who the prince was. She had also seen the festival on board the ship, and she told them where the prince came from, and where his palace stood. Come on, little sister, said the other princesses. Then they entwined their arms and rose up in a long row to the surface of the water, 
close by the spot where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of bright yellow shining stone, with long flights of marble steps, one of which reached quite down to the sea. Splendid gilded cupolas rose over the roof, and between the pillars that surrounded the whole building stood lifelike statues of marble. Through the clear crystal of the lofty windows could be seen noble homes, with costly silk curtains and hangings of tapestry, while the walls were covered with beautiful paintings, which were a pleasure to look at. In the center of the largest saloon a fountain threw its sparkling jets high into the glass cupola of the ceiling, through which the sun shone down upon the water and upon the beautiful plants growing around the basin of the fountain. Now that she knew where he lived, she spent many a morning and many a night on the water near the palace. She would swim much nearer to the shore than any of the others ventured to do. Indeed, once she went quite up the narrow channel under the marble balcony, which threw a broad shadow on the water. Here she would sit and watch the young prince, who thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. She saw him many times of an evening sailing in a pleasant boat, with music playing and flags waving. She peeped out from among the green rushes, and if the wind caught her long silvery white veil, those who saw it believed it to be a swan spreading out its wings. On many a night, too, when the fishermen with their torches were out at sea, she heard them relate so many good things about the doings of the young prince that she was glad she had saved his life, when he had been tossed about half dead on the waves. Then she remembered that his head had rested on her bosom, and how heartily she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of all this and could not even dream of her. She grew more and more fond of human beings, and wished more and more to be able to wander about with those whose world seemed to be so much larger than her own. They could fly over the sea in ships, and mount high hills, which were far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed, the woods and fields, stretched far away beyond the reach of her sight. There was so much that she wished to know, and her sisters were unable to answer all her questions. Then she applied to her old grandmother, who knew all about the upper world, which she very rightly called the lands above the sea. If human beings are not drowned, asked the little mermaid, can they live forever? Do they never die, as we do here in the sea? Yes, replied the old lady, they must also die, and their term of life is even shorter than ours. We sometimes live to three hundred years, but when we cease to exist, here we only become the foam on the surface of the water, and we have not even a grave down here of those we love. We have not immortal souls. We shall never live again. But like the green seaweed, when once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have a soul which lives forever, lives after the body that has been turned to dust. It rises up through the clear pure air beyond the glittering stars. As we rise out of the water and behold all the land of the earth, so do they rise to unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. Why have not we an immortal soul? asked the little mermaid mournfully. I would give gladly all the hundreds of years that I have to live to be a human being only for one day, and to have the hope of knowing the happiness of that glorious world above the stars. You must not think of that, said the old woman. We feel ourselves to be much happier and much better off than human beings. So I shall die, said the little mermaid, and as the foam of the sea I shall be driven about never again to hear the music of the waves, or see the pretty flowers, nor the red sun. Is there anything I can do to win an immortal soul? No, said the old woman unless a man were to love you so much that you were more to him than his father or mother. And if all his thoughts and all his love were fixed upon you, and the priest placed his right hand in yours, and he promised to be true to you here and hereafter, then his soul would glide into your body, and you would obtain a share in the future happiness of mankind. He would give a soul to you, and retain his own as well. But this can never happen. Your fish's tail, which amongst us is considered so beautiful, is thought on earth to be quite ugly. They do not know any better, and they think it necessary to have two stout props, which they call legs, in order to be handsome. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sorrowfully at her fish's tail. Let us be happy, said the old lady, and dart and spring about during the three hundred years that we have to live, which is really quite long enough. After that we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening we are going to have a court ball. End of part two of The Little Mermaid Recording by Ellie, March 2010 Part 3 of The Little Mermaid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. B. Paul The Little Mermaid, Part 3 
It is one of those splendid sights which we can never see on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the large ballroom were of thick but transparent crystal. Many hundreds of colossal shells, some of a deep red, others of a grass green, stood on each side in rows, with blue fire in them which lighted up the whole saloon and shone through the walls so that the sea was also illuminated. Innumerable fishes, great and small, swam past the crystal walls. On some of them the scales glowed with a purple brilliancy, and on others they shone like silver and gold. Through the halls flowed a broad stream, and in it danced the mermen and the mermaids, to the music of their own sweet singing. No one on earth has such a lovely voice as theirs. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than them all. The whole court applauded her with hands and tails, and for a moment her heart felt quite gay, for she knew she had the loveliest voice of any on earth or in the sea. But soon she thought again of the world above her, for she could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she had not an immortal soul like his. Therefore she crept away silently out of her father's palace, and while everything within was gladness and song, she sat in her own little garden, sorrowful and alone. Then she heard the bugle sounding through the water and thought, He is certainly sailing above. He on whom my wishes depend, and in whose hands I should like to place the happiness of my life. I will venture all for him, and to win an immortal soul. When my sisters are dancing in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid, but she can give me counsel and help. And then the little mermaid went out from her garden and took the road to the foaming whirlpools, behind which the sorceress lived. She had never been that way before, neither flowers nor grass grew there. Nothing but bare, grey, sandy ground stretched out to the whirlpool, where the water, like foaming millwheels, whirled round everything that it seized and cast it into the phantomless deep. Through the midst of these crushing whirlpools, the little mermaid was obliged to pass to reach the dominions of the sea witch and also for a long distance the only road lay right across the quantity of a warm, bubbling mire, called by the witcher Turfmoor. Beyond this stood her house, in the center of a strange forest, in which all the trees and flowers were polypi, half animals and half plants. They looked like serpents with a hundred heads growing out of the ground. The branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like flexible worms, moving limb after limb from the root to the top. All that could be reached in the sea they seized upon and held fast, so that it never could escape from their clutches. The little mermaid was so alarmed at what she saw that she stood still and her heart beat with fear, and she was very nearly turning back. But she thought of the prince and of the human soul for which she longed, and her courage returned. She fastened her long flowing hair around her head, so that the polypi might not seize hold of it. She laid her hands together across her bosom, and then she darted forward as a fish should through the water, between the subtle arms and fingers of the ugly polypi, which were stretched out on each side of her. She saw that each held in its grasp something it had seized with its numerous little arms, as if they were iron bands, the white skeletons of human beings who had perished at sea and had sunk into the deep waters, skeletons of land animals, oars, rudders and chests of ships, were lying tightly grasped by the clinging arms. Even a little mermaid, whom they had caught and strangled, and this seemed the most shocking of all to the little princess. She now came to a space of marshy ground in the wood, where large fat water snakes were rolling in the mire, and showing their ugly trip-colored bodies. In the midst of this spot stood a house, built with the bones of shipwrecked human beings. There sat the sea witch, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as people sometimes feed a canary with a piece of sugar. She called the ugly water snakes her little chickens, and allowed them to crawl all over her bosom, I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is very stupid of you, but you shall have your way, and it will bring you to sorrow, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of a fish's tail and to have two supports instead of it, like human beings on earth, so that the young prince may fall in love with you, and that you may have an immortal soul. And then the witch laughed so loud and disgustingly that the toad and the snakes fell to the ground and lay there wriggling about. You are but just in time, said the witch. For, after sunrise tomorrow, I should not be able to help you till the end of another year. I will prepare a draft for you, with which you must swim to land tomorrow before sunrise, and sit down on the shore and drink it. Your tail will then disappear and shrink up into what mankind calls legs, and you will feel great pain as if a sword were passing through you. But all who see you will say that you are the prettiest little human being they ever saw. You will still have the same floating gracefulness of movement and no dancer will ever tread so lightly. 
but at every step you take it will feel as if you are treading upon sharp knives and that the blood must flow if you will be all this i will help you yes i will said the little princess in a trembling voice as she thought of the prince and the immortal soul but think again said the witch for when once your shape has become like a human being you can no more be a mermaid you will never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace again and if you do not win the love of the prince so that he is willing to forget his father and mother for your sake and to love you with his whole soul and to allow the priest to join your hands so that you may be man and wife then you will never have an immortal soul the first morning after he marries another your heart will break and you will become foam on the crest of the waves i will do it said the little mermaid and she became as pale as death but i must be paid also said the witch and it is not a trifle that i ask you have the sweetest voice of any who dwell here in the depths of the sea and you believe that you will be able to charm the prince with it also but this voice you must give to me the best thing you possess i will have for the price of my draught my own blood must be mixed with it that it may be as sharp as a two-edged sword but if you take away my voice said the little mermaid what is left for me your beautiful form your graceful walk and your expressive eyes surely with these you can enchain a man's heart well have you lost your courage put out your little tongue that i may cut it off as my payment then you shall have your powerful draught it shall be said the little mermaid then the witch placed the cauldron on the fire to prepare the magic draught cleanliness is a good thing said she scouring the vessel with snakes which she had tied together in a large knot then she pricked herself in the breast and let the black blood drop into it the steam that rose formed itself into such horrible shapes that no one could look at them without fear every moment the witch threw something into the vessel and when it began to boil the sound was like the weeping of a crocodile when at last the magic draught was ready it looked like the clearest water there it is for you said the witch and then she cut off the mermaid's tongue so that she became dumb and would never again speak or sing if the polypi should seize hold of you as you return through the wood said the witch throw over them a few drops of the potion and their fingers will be torn into a thousand pieces but the little mermaid had no occasion to do this for the polypi sprang back in terror when they caught sight of the glittering draught which shone in her hand like a twinkling star so she passed quickly through the wood and the marsh and between the rushing whirlpools she saw that in her father's palace the torches in the ballroom were extinguished and all was in her sleep but she did not venture to go into them for now she was dumb and going to leave them for ever she felt as if her heart would break she stole into the garden and took a flower from the flower beds of each of her sisters kissed her hand a thousand times toward the palace and then rose through the dark blue waters the sun had not risen when she came in sight of the princess palace and approached the beautiful marble steps but the moon shone clear and bright then the little mermaid drank her magic draught and it seemed as if a twitched sword went through her delicate body she fell into a swoon and lay like one dead when the sun arose and shone over the sea she recovered and felt a sharp pain but just before her stood the handsome young prince he fixed his cool black eyes upon her so earnestly that she cast down her own and then became aware that her fish's tail was gone and that she had as pretty a pair of white legs and tiny feet as any little maiden could have but she had no clothes so she wrapped herself in her long thick hair the prince asked who she was and where she came from and she looked at him mildly and sorrowfully with her deep blue eyes but she could not speak every step she took was as the witch had said it would be she felt as if treading upon the points of needles or sharp knives but she bore it willingly and stepped as lightly by the prince's side as a soap bubble so that he and all who saw her wondered at her graceful swaying movements she was very soon arrayed in costly robes of silk and muslin and was the most beautiful creature in the palace but she was dumb and could neither speak nor sing beautiful female slaves dressed in silk and gold stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents one sang better than all the others and the prince clapped his hands and smiled at her this was great sorrow to the little mermaid she knew how much more sweetly she herself could sing once and she thought oh if he could only know that i have given away my voice for ever to be with him the slaves next performed some pretty fairy-like dances to the sound of the beautiful music then the little mermaid raised her lovely white arms stood on the tips of her toes and glided over the floor and danced as no one yet had been able to dance 
At each moment her beauty became more revealed, and her expressive eyes appealed more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. Everyone was enchanted, especially the prince, who called her his little foundling. And she danced again quite readily to please him, though each time her foot touched the floor, it seemed as if she trod on sharp knives. The prince said she should remain with him always, and she received permission to sleep at his door on a velvet cushion. He had a page's dress made for her, that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode together through the sweet scented woods where the green boughs touched their shoulders and the little birds sang among the fresh leaves she climbed with the prince to the tops of high mountains and although her tender feet bled so that even her steps were marked she only laughed and followed him till they could see the clouds beneath them looking like a flock of birds travelling to distant lands while at the prince's palace and with all the household were asleep she would go and sit on the broad marble steps for it is her burning feet to bathe them in the cold sea water, and then she thought of all those below in the deep. Once, during the night, her sisters came up, arm in arm, singing sorrowfully, as they floated on the water. She beckoned to them, and then they recognized her, and told her how she had grieved them. After that they came to the same place every night, and once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been to the surface of the sea for many years, and they were seeking her father with his crown on his head. They stretched out their hands towards her, but they did not venture so near to the land as her sisters did. End of part three of the Little Mermaid, recording by Ellie in July two thousand and twelve. Part four of the Little Mermaid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. B. Paul The Little Mermaid, Part 4 As the days passed, she loved the prince more fondly, and he loved her as he would love a little child, but it never came into his head to make her his wife. Yet, unless he married her, she could not receive an immortal soul, and on the morning after his marriage with another, she would dissolve into the foam of the sea. Do you not love me best of them all? The eyes of the little mermaid seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. Yes, you are dear to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart and you are the most devoted to me. You are like the young maiden whom I once saw, but whom I shall never meet again. I was in a ship that was wrecked and the waves cast me ashore near a holy temple where several young maidens performed the service. The youngest of them found me on the shore and saved my life. I saw her but twice and she was the only one in the world whom I could love. But you are like her, and you have almost driven her image out of my mind. She belongs to the holy temple, and my good fortune has sent you to me instead of her, and we will never part. Ah, he knows not that it was I who saved his life, thought the little mermaid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat beneath the foam and watched till the human beings came to help him. I saw the pretty maiden that he loves better than he loves me, and the little mermaid sighed deeply, but she could not shed tears. He says the maiden belongs to the holy temple, therefore she will never return to the world. They will meet no more while I am by his side and see him every day. I will take care of him and love him and give up my life for his sake. Very soon it was said that the prince must marry and that the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king would be his wife, for a fine ship was being fitted out. Although the prince gave out that he merely intended to pay a visit to the king, it was generally supposed that he really went to see his daughter. A great company were to go with him. The little mermaid smiled and shook her head. She knew the prince's thoughts better than any of the others. I must travel, he said to her. I must see this beautiful princess. My parents desire it. But they will not oblige me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. She is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were forced to choose a bride, I would rather choose you, Madame Foundling, with those expressive eyes. And then he kissed her rosy mouth, played with her long waving hair, and laid his hand on her heart, while she dreamed of human happiness and an immortal soul. You are not afraid of the sea, Madame Child, said he, as they stood on the deck of the noble ship, which was to carry them to the country of the neighboring king. And then he told her of the storm and of calm, of strange fishes in the deep beneath them, and what the divers had seen there, and she smiled at his description, for she knew better than any one what wonders were at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlight, when all on board were asleep, excepting the man at the helm who was steering, she sat on the deck, gazing down through the clear water. 
She thought she could distinguish her father's castle and upon it her aged grandmother with the silver crown on her head, looking through the rushing tide at the keel of the vessel. Then her sisters came up on the waves and gazed at her mournfully, wringing their white hands. She beckoned to them and smiled and wanted to tell them how happy and well off she was. But the cabin boy approached, and when the sisters dived down he thought it was only the form of the sea which he saw. The next morning the ship sailed into the harbor of a beautiful town, belonging to the king whom the prince was going to visit. The church bells were ringing, and from the high towers sounded a flourish of trumpets, and soldiers with flying colors and glittering bayonets lined the rocks through which they passed. Every day was a festival. Balls and entertainments followed one another. But the princess had not yet appeared. People said that she was being brought up and educated in a religious house, where she was learning every royal virtue. At last she came. Then the little mermaid, who was very anxious to see whether she was really beautiful, was obliged to acknowledge that she had never seen a more perfect vision of beauty. Her skin was delicately fair, and beneath her long dark eyelashes her loving blue eyes shone with truth and purity. It was you, said the prince, who saved my life when I lay dead on the beach, and he folded his blushing bride in his arms. Oh, I'm too happy, said he to the little mermaid. My fondest hopes are fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for your devotion to me is great and sincere. The little mermaid kissed his hand, and felt as if her heart were already broken. His wedding morning would bring death to her, and she would change into the form of the sea. All the church bells rang, and the heralds rose above the town proclaiming the betrothal. Perfumed oil was burning in costly silver lamps on every altar. The priests waved the censers, while the bride and bridegroom joined their hands and received the blessing of the bishop. The little mermaid, dressed in silk and gold, held up the bride's train, but her ears heard nothing of the festive music, and her eyes sounded the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of death which was coming to her, and of all she had lost in the world. On the same evening the bride and bridegroom went on board the ship. Cannons were roaring, flags waving, and in the center of the ship a costly tent of purple and gold had been erected. It contained elegant couches for the reception of the bridal pair during the night. The ship with swelling sails and favorable wind glided away smoothly and lightly over the calm sea. When it grew dark, a number of colored lamps were lit, and the sailors danced merrily on deck. The little mermaid could not help thinking of her first rising out of sea, when she had seen similar festivities and joys, and she joined in the dance, poised herself in the air as a swallow when he pursues his prey, and all present cheered her with wonder. She had never danced so elegantly before. Her tender feet felt as if cut with sharp knives, but she cared not for it. A sharper pang had pierced through her heart. She knew this was the last evening she should ever see the prince, for whom she had forsaken her kindred and her home. She had given up her beautiful voice and suffered unheard of pain daily for him, while he knew nothing of it. This was the last evening that she should breathe the same air with him, or gaze on the starry sky and the deep sea. An eternal night without a thought or a dream awaited her. She had no soul, and now she could never win one. All was joy and gaiety on board the ship till long after midnight. She laughed and danced with the rest, while the thoughts of death were in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride while she played with his raven hair, till they went arm in arm to rest in the splendid tent. Then all became still on board the ship. The helmsman, alone awake, stood at the helm. The little mermaid leaned her white arms on the edge of the vessel and looked towards the east for the first blush of morning, for that first ray of dawn that would bring her death. She saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were as pale as herself, for the long, beautiful hair waved no more in the wind and had been cut off. We have given our hair to the witch, said they, to obtain help for you, that you may not die tonight. She has given us a knife. Here it is. See, it is very sharp. Before the sun rises, you must plunge it into the heart of the prince. When the warm blood falls upon your feet, they will grow together again and form into a fish's tail and you will be once more a mermaid and return to us to live out your three hundred years before you die and change into the salt sea foam. Haste then, here you must die before sunrise. Our old grandmother mourned so for you that her white hair is falling off from sorrow as yours fell under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back, hasten. Do you not see the first red streaks in the sky? In a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die, and then they sighed deeply and mournfully and sank down beneath the waves. The little mermaid drew back the crimson curtain of the tent and beheld the fair bride with her head resting on the prince's breast. She bent down and kissed his fair brow, 
Then looked at the sky, on which the rosy dawn grew brighter and brighter. Then she glanced at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes on the prince, who whispered the name of his bride in his dreams. She was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the hand of the little mermaid. Then she flung it far from her into the waves. The water turned red where it fell, and the drops that spurted it up looked like blood. She cast one more lingering, half-fainting glance at the prince, and then threw herself from the ship into the sea, and thought her body was dissolving into foam. The sun rose above the waves, and his warm rays fell on the cold foam of the little mermaid, who did not feel as if she were dying. She saw the bright sun, and all around her floated hundreds of transparent beautiful beings. She could see through them the white sails of the ship and the red clouds in the sky. Their speech was melodious, but too ethereal to be heard by mortal ears, as they were also unseen by mortal eyes. The little mermaid perceived that she had a body like theirs, and that she continued to rise higher and higher out of the foam. Where am I? asked she, and her voice sounded ethereal, as the voice of those who were with her. No earthly music could imitate it. Among the daughters of the air, answered one of them, a mermaid has not an immortal soul nor can she obtain one unless she wins the love of a human being. On the power of another hangs their eternal destiny. But the daughters of the air, although they do not possess an immortal soul, can, by their good deeds, procure one for themselves. We fly to warm countries and cool the sultry air that destroys mankind with the pestilence. We carry the perfume of flowers to spread health and restoration. After we have striven for three hundred years to all the good in our power, we receive an immortal soul and take part of the happiness of mankind. You, poor little mermaid, have tried with your whole heart to do as we are doing. You have suffered and endured and raised yourself to the spirit world by your good deeds, and now, by striving for three hundred years in the same way, you may obtain an immortal soul. The little mermaid lifted her glorified eyes towards the sun and felt them, for the first time filling with tears. On the ship in which she had left the prince there were life and noise. She saw him and his beautiful bride searching for her. Sorrowfully they gazed at the pearly foam, as if they knew she had thrown herself into the waves. Unseen she kissed the forehead of the bride, and fanned the prince, and then mounted with the other children of the air to a rosy cloud that floated through the ether. After three hundred years thus shall we float into the kingdom of heaven, said she. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one of her companions. Unseen we can enter the houses of men where there are children, and for every day on which we find a good child who is the joy of his parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know, when we fly through the room, that we smile with joy at his conduct, for we can count one year less of our three hundred years. But when we see a naughty or wicked child, we shed tears of sorrow, and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial. End of the Little Mermaid, Part Four, Recording by Ellie, March 2010. Part One of the Happy Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Happy Family, Part One. The largest green leaf in this country is certainly the burdock leaf. If you hold it in front of you, it is large enough for an apron, and if you hold it over your head, it is almost as good as an umbrella. It is so wonderfully large. A burdock never grows alone. Where it grows, there are many more, and it is a splendid sight. And all its splendor is good for snails. The great white snails, which grand people in olden times used to have made into fricassees. And when they had eaten them, they would say, Oh, what a delicious dish! For these people really thought them good, and these snails lived on burdock leaves, and for them the burdock was planted. There was once an old estate, where no one now lived to require snails. Indeed, the owners had all died out, but the burdock still flourished. It grew over all the beds and walks of the garden, its growth had no check, till it became at last quite a forest of burdocks. Here and there stood an apple or a plum tree. But for this, nobody would have thought the place had ever been a garden. It was burdock from one end to the other, and here lived the last two surviving snails. They knew not themselves how old they were, but they could remember the time when there were a great many more of them, and that they were descended from a family which came from foreign lands, and that the whole forest had been planted for them and theirs. They had never been away from the garden. 
but they knew that another place once existed in the world called the duke's palace castle in which some of their relations had been boiled till they became black and were then laid on a silver dish but what was done afterwards they did not know besides they could not imagine exactly how it felt to be boiled and placed on a silver dish but no doubt it was something very fine and highly genteel neither the cockchafer nor the toad nor the earthworm whom they questioned about it would give them the least information for none of their relations had ever been cooked or served on a silver dish the old white snails were the most aristocratic race in the world they knew that the forest had been planted for them and the nobleman's castle had been built entirely that they might be cooked and laid on silver dishes they lived quite retired and very happily and as they had no children of their own they had adopted a little common snail which they brought up as their own child the little one would not grow for he was only a common snail but the old people particularly the mother snail declared that she could easily see how he grew and when the father said he could not perceive it she begged him to feel the little snail's shell and he did so and found that the mother was right End of part one of the happy family recording by ellie in august 2012 part two of the happy family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ellie the snow queen and other stories by hans christian andersen translated by h b paul the happy family part two one day it rained very fast listen what the drumming there is on the burdock leaves turn 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 said the father snail there come the drops said the mother they are trickling down the stalks we shall have it very wet here presently i am very glad we have such good houses and that the little one has one of his own there has really been more done for us than for any other creature it is quite plain that we are the most noble people in the world we have houses from our birth and the burdock forest has been planted for us. I should very much like to know how far it extends, and what lies beyond it. There can be nothing better than we have here, said the father snail. I wish for nothing more. Yes, but I do, said the mother. I should like to be taken to the palace, and boiled and laid upon a silver dish, as was done to all our ancestors. And you may be sure it must be something very uncommon. The nobleman's castle, perhaps, has fallen to decay, said the snail father or the burdock wood may have grown out you need not be in a hurry you are always so impatient and the youngster is getting just the same he has been here three days creeping to the top of that stalk i feel quite giddy when i look at him you must not scold him said the mother snail he creeps so very carefully he will be the joy of our home and we old folks have nothing else to live for but have you ever thought where we are to get a wife for him do you think that farther out in the wood there may be others of our race there may be black snails no doubt said the old snail black snails without houses but they are so vulgar and conceited too but we can give the ants a commission they run here and there as if they all had so much business to get through they most likely will know of a wife for our youngster i certainly know a most beautiful bride said one of the ants but i fear it would not do for she is a queen that does not matter said the old snail has she a house she has a palace replied the ant a most beautiful ant palace with seven hundred passages thank you said the mother snail but our boy shall not go to live in an ant hill if you know of nothing better we will give the commission to the white nets they fly about in rain and sunshine they know the burdock wood from one end to the other we have a wife for him said the nets a hundred men steps from here there is a little snail with a house sitting in the gooseberry bush she is quite alone and old enough to be married it is only one hundred men steps from here then let her come to him said the old people here is the whole burdock forest she has only a bush so they brought the little lady snail she took eight days to perform the journey but that was just as it ought to be for it showed her to be one of the right breeding and then they had the wedding six glowworms gave as much light as they could but in other respects it was all very quiet for the old snails could not be a festivities or a crowd but a beautiful speech was made by the mother snail the father could not speak he was too much overcome then they gave the whole burdock forest to the young snails as an inheritance and repeated what they had so often said that it was the finest place in the world and that if they led upright and honorable lives and the family increased 
they and their children might some day be taken to the nobleman's palace to be boiled black and laid on a silver dish and when they had finished speaking the old couple crept into their houses and came out no more for they slept the young snail pair now ruled the forest and had numerous progeny but as the young ones were never boiled or laid in silver dishes they concluded that the castle had fallen into decay and that all the people in the world were dead and as nobody contradicted them they thought they must be right and the rain fell upon the burdock leaves to play the drum for them and the sun shone to paint colors on the burdock forest for them and they were very happy the whole family were entirely and perfectly happy End of part two of the happy family recording by ellie june two thousand and ten part one of the nightingale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the snow queen and other stories by hans christian andersen translated by h b paul the nightingale part one in china you know the emperor is a chinese and all those about him are chinamen also the story i am going to tell you happened a great many years ago so it is well to hear it now before it is forgotten the emperor's palace was the most beautiful in the world it was built entirely of porcelain and very costly but so delicate and brittle that whoever touched it was obliged to be careful in the garden could be seen the most singular flowers with pretty silver bells tied to them which tinkled so that everyone who passed could not help noticing the flowers. Indeed, everything in the emperor's garden was remarkable, and it extended so far that the gardener himself did not know where it ended. Those who travelled beyond its limits knew that there was a noble forest with lofty trees, sloping down to the deep blue sea, and the great ships sailed under the shadow of its branches. In one of these trees lived the nightingale, who sang so beautifully that even the poor fisherman, who had so many other things to do, would stop and listen. Sometimes, when they went at night to spread their nets, they would hear her sing and say, Oh, is not that beautiful? But when they returned to their fishing, they forgot the bird until the next night. Then they would hear it again and exclaim, Oh, how beautiful is the nightingale's song! Travelers from every country in the world came to the city of the emperor, which they admired very much, as well as the palace and the gardens. But when they heard the nightingale, they all declared it to be the best of all and the travellers on their return home related what they had seen and learned men wrote books containing descriptions of the town the palace and the gardens but they did not forget the nightingale which was really the greatest wonder and those who could write poetry composed beautiful verses about the nightingale who lived in a forest near the deep sea the books travelled all over the world and some of them came into the hands of the emperor and he sat in his golden chair and as he read he nodded disapproval every moment for it pleased him to find such a beautiful description of his city, his palace, and his gardens. But when he came to the words, The nightingale is the most beautiful of all, he exclaimed, What is this? I know nothing of any nightingale. Is there such a bird in my empire, and even in my garden? I have never heard of it. Something, it appears, may be learned from books. Then he called one of his lords in waiting, who was so high bred that when any in an inferior rank to himself spoke to him or asked him a question he would answer pooh which means nothing there is a very wonderful bird mentioned here called the nightingale said the emperor they say it is the best thing in my large kingdom why have i not been told of it i have never heard the name replied the cavalier she has not been presented at court it is my pleasure that she shall appear this evening said the emperor the whole world knows what i possess better than i do myself I have never heard of her, said the cavalier, yet I will endeavor to find her. But where was the nightingale to be found? The nobleman went up the stairs and down, through halls and passages. Yet none of those whom he met had heard of the bird. So he returned to the emperor, and said it must be a fable, invented by those who had written the book. Your imperial majesty, said he, cannot believe everything contained in books. Sometimes they are only fiction, or what is called the black art. But the book in which I have read this account, said the emperor, was sent to me by the great and mighty emperor of Japan, and therefore it cannot contain a falsehood. I will hear the nightingale. She must be here this evening. She has my highest favor, and if she does not come, the whole court shall be trampled upon after supper is ended. Tsing Pei cried the lord in waiting, and again ran up and down the stairs, through all the halls and corridors, and half the court ran with him, for they did not like the idea of being trampled upon. 
There was a great inquiry about this wonderful nightingale, whom all the world knew, but who was unknown to the court. At last they met with a poor little girl in the kitchen who said, Oh yes, I know the nightingale quite well. Indeed, she can sing. Every evening I have permission to take home to my poor sick mother the scraps from the table. She lives down by the seashore, and as I come back I feel tired, and sit down in the wood to rest, and listen to the nightingale's song. Then the tears come into my eyes, and it is just as if my mother kissed me. Little maiden, said the lord in waiting, I will obtain for you constant employment in the kitchen, and you shall have permission to see the emperor dine, if you will lead us to the nightingale, for she is invited for this evening to the palace. So she went to the wood where the nightingale sang, and half the court followed her. As they went along, a cow began lowing. Oh, said the young courtier, now we have found her. What wonderful power for such a small creature! I have certainly heard it before. No, that is only a cow lowing, said the little girl. We are a long way from the place yet. Then some frogs began to croak in the marsh. Beautiful, said the young courtier again. Now I hear it, tinkling like little church bells. No, those are frogs, said the little maiden. But I think we shall hear her soon now. And presently the nightingale began to sing. Hark, hark, there she is, said the girl. And there she sits, she added pointing to a little grey bird who was perched on a bow. Is it possible, said the lord in waiting. I never imagined it would be a little plain, simple thing like that. She has certainly changed colour at seeing so many grand people around her. Little nightingale, cried the girl, raising her voice. Our most gracious emperor wishes you to sing before him. With the greatest pleasure, said the nightingale, and began to sing most delightfully. It sounds like tiny glass bells, said the lord in waiting, and see how her little throat works. It is surprising that we have never heard this before. She will be a great success at court. Shall I sing once more before the emperor? asked the nightingale, who thought he was present. My excellent little nightingale, said the courtier, I have the great pleasure of inviting you to a court festival this evening, where you will gain imperial favor by your charming song. My song sounds best in green wood, said the bird, but still she came willingly when she heard the emperor's wish. The palace was elegantly decorated for the occasion. The walls and floors of porcelain glittered in the light of a thousand lamps. Beautiful flowers, round which little bells were tied, stood in the corridors. But with the running to and fro and the draught, these bells tinkled so loudly that no one could speak to be heard. In the centre of the great hall a golden perch had been fixed for the nightingale to sit on. The whole court was present, and the little kitchen maid had received permission to stand by the door. She was not installed as a real court cook. All were in full dress, and every eye was turned to the little grey bird when the emperor nodded to her to begin. The nightingale sang so sweetly that the tears came to the emperor's eyes and then rolled down his cheeks, as her song became still more touching and went to everyone's heart. The emperor was so delighted that he declared the nightingale should have his golden slipper to wear around her neck. But she declined the honor with thanks. She had been sufficiently rewarded already. I have seen tears in the emperor's eyes, she said. This is my richest reward. An emperor's tears have wonderful power. They are quite sufficient honor for me. And then she sang again, more enchantingly than ever. That singing is a lovely gift, said the ladies of the court to each other. And then they took water in their mouths to make them utter the gurgling sounds of the nightingale when they spoke to anyone, so that they might fancy themselves nightingales. And the footmen and chambermaids also expressed their satisfaction, which is saying a great deal, for they are very difficult to please. In fact, the nightingale's visit was more successful. She was now to remain at court, to have her own cage, with liberty to go out twice a day, and once during the night. Twelve servants were appointed to attend her on these occasions, who each held her by a silken string fastened to her leg. There was certainly not much pleasure in this kind of flying. The whole city spoke of the wonderful bird, and when two people met, one said nighting, and the other said gale, and they understood what was meant, for nothing else was talked of. Eleven peddler's children were named after her, but not one of them could sing a note. End of part one of the Nightingale, read by Ellie, in August two thousand and twelve. Part two of the Nightingale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie. The Snow Queen and Other Stories by Hans Christian Andersen Translated by H. B. Paul 
The Nightingale Part Two. One day the Emperor received a large packet on which was written the Nightingale. Here is no doubt a new book about our celebrated bird, said the Emperor, but instead of a book it was a work of art contained in a casket, an artificial nightingale made to look like a living one, and covered all over with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. As soon as the artificial bird was wound up, it could sing like a real one, and could move its tail up and down, which sparkled with silver and gold. Round its neck hung a piece of ribbon, on which was written, The Emperor of Japan's nightingale is poor compared to that of the Emperor of China's, this is very beautiful, exclaimed all who saw it, and he who had brought the artificial bird received the title of imperial nightingale bringer in chief. Now they must sing together, said the court, and what a duet it will be. But they did not get on well, for the real nightingale sang in its own natural way, but the artificial bird sang only waltzes. That is not the fault, said the music master. It is quite perfect to my taste. So then it had to sing alone and was as successful as the real bird. Besides, it was so much prettier to look at, for it sparkled like bracelets and breastpins. Three and thirty times did it sing the same tunes without being tired. The people would gladly have heard it again, but the emperor said the living nightingale ought to sing something. But where was she? No one had noticed her when she flew out at the open window, back to her own green woods. What a strange conduct, said the emperor, when her flight had been discovered, and all the courtiers blamed her, and said she was a very ungrateful creature. But we have the best bird after all, said one, and then they would have the bird sing again, although it was the thirty-fourth time they had listened to the same piece, and even then they had not learned it, for it was rather difficult. But the music master praised the bird in the highest degree, and even asserted that it was better than the real nightingale, not only in its dress and beautiful diamonds, but also in its musical power. For you must perceive, my chief lord and emperor, that with the real nightingale we can never tell what is going to be sung. But with this bird everything is settled. It can be opened and explained, so that people may understand how the waltzes are formed, and why one note follows upon another. This is exactly what we think, they all replied, and then the music master received permission to exhibit the bird to the people on the following Sunday, and the emperor commanded that they should be present to hear it sing. When they heard it, they were like people intoxicated. However, it must have been with drinking tea, which is quite a Chinese custom. They all said, Oh! and held up their forefingers and nodded, but the poor fisherman who had heard the real nightingale said, It sounds pretty enough, and the melodies are all alike, yet there seems something wanting, I cannot exactly tell what. And after this the real nightingale was banished from the empire, and the artificial bird placed on a silk cushion close to the emperor's bed. The presents of gold and precious stones which had been received with it were round the bird, and it was now advanced to the title of little imperial toilet singer, and to the rank of number one on the left hand, for the emperor considered the left side on which the heart lies as the most noble, and the heart of an emperor's is in the same place as that of other people. The music master wrote the work in twenty-five volumes about the artificial bird which was very learned and very long, and full of the most difficult Chinese words. Yet all the people said they had read it and understood it for fear of being thought stupid and having their bodies trampled upon. So a year passed, and the emperor, the court, and all the other Chinese knew every little turn in the artificial bird's song, and for that same reason it pleased them better. They could sing with the bird, which they often did. The street boys sang, see, see, cluck, 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 and the emperor himself could sing it also. It was really most amusing. One evening, when the artificial bird was singing its best, and the emperor lay in bed listening to it, something inside the bird sounded with. Then a spring cracked. Whirr went all the wheels, running round, and then the music stopped. The emperor immediately sprang out of bed and called for his physician, but what could he do? Then they sent for the watchmaker, and after a great deal of talking and examination, the bird was put into something like order. But he said it must be used very carefully, as the barrels were worn, and it would be impossible to put in new ones without injuring the music. Now there was great sorrow, as the bird could only be allowed to play once a year, and even that was dangerous for the works inside it. Then the music master made a little speech, full of hard words, and declared that the bird was as good as ever, and, of course, no one contradicted him. Five years passed, and then a real grief came upon the land. The Chinese really were fond of the emperor, and now he lay so ill that he wasn't expected to live. Already a new emperor had been chosen, and the people who stood in the street asked the lord-in-waiting how the old emperor was, but he only said poo and shook his head. 
cold and pale lay the emperor in his royal bed the whole court thought he was dead and everyone ran away to pay homage to his successor the chamberlains went out to have a talk on the matter and the ladies maids invited company to take coffee cloths had been laid down in the halls and passages so that not a footstep could be heard and all was silent and still but the emperor was not yet dead although he lay white and stiff on his gorgeous bed with the long velvet curtains and heavy gold tassels a window stood open and the moon shone in upon the emperor and the artificial bird the poor emperor finding who could scarcely breathe with a strange weight on his chest opened his eyes and saw death sitting there all around the bed and peeping through the long velvet curtains were a number of strange heads some very ugly others lovely and gentle looking these were the emperor's good and bad deeds which stared him in the face now death sat at his heart do you remember this do you recollect that they asked after one another thus bringing to his remembrance circumstances which made the perspiration stand on his brow i know nothing about it said the emperor music music he cried the large chinese drum that they may not hear what they say but they still went on and death nodded like a chinaman to all they said music music shouted the emperor you precious golden bird sing pray sing i have given you gold and costly presents i've even hung my golden slipper around your neck sing sing but the bird remained silent there was no one to wind it up and therefore it could not sing a note death continued to stare at the emperor with his cold hollow eyes and the room was fearfully still suddenly there came through the open window the sound of sweet music outside on the bow of a tree sat the living nightingale she had heard of the emperor's illness and was therefore come to sing to him of hope and trust and as she sang the shadows grew paler and paler the blood in the emperor's veins flowed more rapidly and gave life to his weak limbs and even death himself listened and said go on little nightingale go on then will you give me the beautiful golden sword and the rich banner and will you give me the emperor's crown said the bird so death gave up each of these treasures for a song and the nightingale continued her singing she sang of the quiet churchyard where the white roses grow where the elder tree wafts its perfume on the breeze and the fresh sweet grass is moistened by the moon's tears then death longed to go and see his garden and floated out through the window in the form of a cold white mist thanks thanks you heavenly little bird i know you well i banished you from my kingdom once and yet you have charmed away the evil faces from my bed and banished death from my heart with your song how can i reward you you have already rewarded me said the nightingale i shall never forget that i drew tears from your eyes the first time i sang to you these are the jewels that rejoice the singer's heart but now sleep and grow strong and well again i will sing for you again and as she sang the emperor fell into a sweet sleep and how mild and refreshing that slumber was when he awoke strengthened and restored the sun shone brightly through the window but not one of his servants returned they all believed he was dead only the nightingale still sat beside him and sang you must always remain with me said the emperor you shall sing only when it pleases you and i will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces no do not do that replied the nightingale the bird did very well as long as it could keep it here still i cannot live in the palace and build my nest but let me come when i like i will sit on a bow outside your window in the evening and sing to you so that you may be happy and have thoughts full of joy i will sing to you of those who are happy and those who suffer of the good and the evil who are hidden around you the little singing bird flies far from you and your court to the home of the fisherman and the peasant's cot i love your heart better than your crown and yet something holy lingers around it also i will come i will sing to you but you must promise me one thing everything said the emperor who having dressed himself in his imperial robes stood with the hand that held the heavy golden sword pressed to his heart i only ask one thing she replied let no one know that you have a little bird who tells you everything it will be the best to conceal it so saying the nightingale flew away the servants now came in to look after the dead emperor when lo there he stood and to their astonishment said good morning end of part two of the nightingale recording by ellie july two thousand and ten